How to rebrand your photography business. Do you wanna rebrand your photography business but you're not really sure how? Well, I've got you covered. By answering these five simple questions, you will have everything dialed in and be ready to go. Now, all five of these questions are super important and you don't wanna skip any of them because it's really gonna hurt your chance of success in this rebrand. So watch all the way to the end to make sure you don't miss anything. It's showtime. Hello, I'm Mike Lloyd. I run a multi six figure boudoir studio in Silicon Valley, California, and I freaking love branding. Love it. Yes, I love that man of mine. Now, I got to hang out with Brian Smith, the founder of Ugg Boots, a handful of times. We watched the Super Bowl together a couple years ago, and we were critiquing the commercials that had come on. That was so much fun. And when we were talking about this, I asked him, how do you define a brand? Because he's got a book about this. And he said, a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's like the personality, the identity of the company. So just like a person will have different traits, behaviors, you know, when you describe a person to somebody, you generally don't say their height in feet and inches, you might say they're athletic, or they like organic things, or they're very nice to people, or they're kind of a jerk, or things like that. That to me is how I define a brand. It's it's the personality of the company. Of course. So when photographers tell me, well, I think I'm going to rebrand because I'm not really getting any clients clients and all they do is change their logo and maybe their color scheme, that's not a rebrand. That's just like changing your shirt. It's not actually changing the personality. So the five questions to ask when deciding to rebrand. First, why are you rebranding? Number two, where in the market do you want to be? Three, what are some other companies that serve your same client? Four, do you speak the right language? And five, do you have brand guidelines? So let's start with number one. Why are you rebranding? A lot of times photographers will do this because it's more fun to play around in Canva designing a new logo and a new color scheme than it is to actually fix what's broken in your business because that means accountability and it's less fun than an art project. However, I challenge you, if that is the case, to reconsider your mindset. Let's reframe this. It's not fun to not book clients. We can all agree on that. We don't want to struggle. We want to build a thriving, profitable business. But if we ignore the things that really matter and just tinker elsewhere, we're never going to get beyond that step. So if you look at it in terms of solving a puzzle, it's a riddle. It's like a, you know, the old Dune video games where you had to put everything in the right combination, the right order, and then suddenly everything unlocks. <laughs> That's what it's like to run a business. So if things aren't working, you aren't booking clients, you're not making money, people say you're too expensive, or you don't have a big portfolio of work, you don't feel confident going out marketing your services, changing your logo isn't going to help any of those things. And a rebrand, unless you've decided you want to switch directions and go from light and airy work to dark and moody, maybe you just want to photograph people with different disabilities or LGBTQ clients, or you just want to focus on doudoir, whatever it may be, those are all great reasons for a rebrand. But if it's because you're struggling to book clients, not a good reason for a rebrand. I've got other videos on marketing, on sales, on pricing, on everything else you're going to need to know if that's the case. But let's assume you are getting clients, things are working, you just want to head in a little different direction. This is a good time to move forward. So let's head on to point number two. Where in the market do you want to be? Do you want to be high-end, ultra-premium luxury service? Do you want to be more of like picture people, glamour shots, or somewhere in between? There's no wrong answer. You just need to identify where you want to be. If you want to be the Target store that caters to a ton of people, you have a lot of services and products you offer, you have low price points, that's great. You can make a ton of money. If you would rather shoot 50 people a year instead of 200 people a year and still make the same money and provide a higher-end luxury service, that's great too. You can do very well with both of these business models. You just have to identify which one you want to do. Because if you say you're going to be a high-end luxury service and 
everything on your website is talking about great value, low prices, things like that, which I'm going to get into when we talk about language, that doesn't align. So everything in your brand needs to align. Just like we go back to the personality metaphor. If someone says that they're vegetarian, they support animal rights, they don't wear anything made of leather, and then you see them in a steakhouse, that'd be weird, right? It's the same with your business. So if you tell people that you are a certain way, but your actions don't align, your brand is broken. Point number three, or question number three, who else is serving your client? This is a great way to figure out some little nuanced ways to present your brand. So if you want to do the high-end luxury market and you want to look up how other companies are marketing to those same clients, it's a great opportunity to learn what those clients respond to. Now, if you want to look up luxury cars, for example, you're not going to go BMW, Mercedes, Audi, because those aren't the same level of luxury as, say, maybe an Aston Martin or a Bugatti or Lamborghini, right? The really high-end cars, and there are ones even up there, like McLaren, for example. So you want to look up the ultra-high premium brands, maybe the most expensive hotels in the world. Google that list and look at the descriptions they use on their room. Words like opulent. They're not going to be describing the free breakfast buffet. They're not even going to mention that because you're just going to go pay for it. And they'll probably have you know, a Michelin-rated restaurant there in the hotel. It's a great opportunity to learn how to present your brand when you look how other people are doing it. Also, when you look up these lists of other companies who cater to your clients, you can then look for those similar businesses locally, and these are great vendor relationship partnerships that you can create now that you know the kinds of businesses to look for and that you cater to their same clients. Number four, and I've been alluding to this one every step of the way so far, do you speak their language? I read a book called Lingo by Jeffrey Shaw. This is the best book that I've read that covers this sort of information. So when you speak their language, it's not English versus Spanish versus Mandarin versus Portuguese. It's are you communicating the same things that they are looking to receive? Okay, what do I mean by this? Let's talk restaurants. If you go to a restaurant, let's say Cheesecake Factory, and there's an appetizer for $17. It's not going to cost $17. It's going to be $16.99 because that's what Cheesecake Factory does. That's the market they're going toward. That penny, you're like, well, it's a penny. It's not a big deal. But it is because it's not $17. It's only $16.99. And those clients are more price conscious. Whereas if you go to a fine dining restaurant, it won't even have 17.00. It's just going to say 17. It won't even have a dollar sign or whatever your currency is. The fine dining restaurants just have a number next to their their food items. People don't care if it's one penny less. $17 groovy. They'd probably rather have it cost $27 for the same thing rather than $16.99 you would get over at Cheesecake Factory. And like I talked about before, with the hotel rooms, if they're describing the concierge, the Egyptian cotton sheets, if they're talking the marble bathtubs, if they're talking the extravagant decor, the Picassos hanging up in the lobby, they're not going to mention a free breakfast or a free shuttle to the airport. Maybe they'll include the shuttle to the airport, but they're not going to mention complimentary free shuttle service to and from the airport because they're not going after the kind of client who cares whether or not it costs money. They might include things at no cost, no cost, even though you're paying thousands a night for the room, but that's not a selling point. They have the service, but that it's free doesn't matter. So when you're putting together your experiences, is it all inclusive? Are you including hair and makeup? Is it an experience or is it a photo shoot? Are they getting a family heirloom or is it a wedding album? How are you describing the same things? Because the verbiage you use is communicated to two totally different markets. And again, everything needs to align. So if you say you're catering to a certain type of client, then you actually have to speak to that client in a way that they understand. Now the last one. This is what makes it really, really easy to do most everything else in your business moving forward. That is creating brand guidelines. You're like, okay, what are brand guidelines? It's my brand. Why do I have to set rules? It's not quite like that. Kind of your brand guidelines are like a cheat sheet for you moving forward. So whenever you create a blog post or 
any marketing material or you make gift certificates or you create your studio environment. Everything aligns with your brand guidelines. Yes, it'll have things like your logo. When is an appropriate time to use the logo? How large can you make it? How small can you make it? What color should it be? What if it's against a white background or a black background? Things like that, super important. What kind of fonts will you use in any of your printed materials? Because if you're using Comic Sans and a high-end luxury brand, that doesn't work. That clashes. Just like you're not going to use the Vogue font if you have like happy, fun time, kids playhouse sort of photo studio. We're talking boudoir, so hopefully that's not the case, but you get my point. Your brand guidelines will outline all of this. So when you're making those gift cards, you don't have to think, well, what colors should I do this time? Or what fonts should I put? You've already got that mapped out. But in addition to that, you're also going to talk about verbiage. You're going to talk about the benefits of working with you, the things that are important to your clients. So when you create these marketing materials, write this blog post, you know who you're speaking to. And you can remind yourself, don't talk about price. Talk about value. Talk about what they get for the experience. And if they are more of a price conscious market, you're going for a a higher volume, a little bit lighter experience as well. I don't want to say less experience than like a high end luxury boutique would be. But if you're going for more of a volume service uh, and spending less time with each client, you're going to charge a little bit less for that, but make up for it by serving more people. I'm rambling now. All of this is going to be outlined in your brand guidelines. It also makes it easier to work with advertisers. So when you outsource any of your social media management or your marketing or anything else, you can give them these brand guidelines. It's usually put together in a multi-page PDF. There are a ton of templates online for them. Then that person who you're working with can go through and see, okay, these are the kind of words this person uses. These are the fonts they use. These are sample images that they use. All of these things are already compiled and it makes it really easy to do anything moving forward. There's no more guesswork. So having brand guidelines is ideal. And it's like the constitution, at least if you're familiar with that here in America, where it's the the governing body to our brand, but you can make amendments. So let's say in five years, you decide you want to switch colors up, just something different. Maybe you had a light gray. Now it's a metallic silver. Maybe you had warmer tones. You want to go cooler tones. Totally cool. Update them in the brand guidelines. Everything stays consistent. Really important to stay consistent. That's where the brand guidelines come into place. So there you go. The five things that you need to consider when doing a rebrand. First, should you actually be rebranding or is something else broken in the company? Number two, where in the market do you want to be? Number three, What are some other businesses catering to your clients who you could get inspiration from? Number four, are you speaking your client's language? And number five, do you have some brand guidelines? So I love branding and I love building businesses. And if you want to chat about this, you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. So you can email me, mike at boudoirguild.com or head over to our Facebook group. I will drop that link down in the description. And if you want to fast track your way to a profitable boudoir studio, head to boudoirguild.com and I will see you inside. 